Welcome. Uh, praise be Jesus Christ. Uh, today is the feast day of Our Lady of Guadalupe. And so uh, today, instead of focusing on the second uh, Sunday in Advent uh, reflection on the Gospel, we're actually going to look at uh, today's feast, Our Lady of Guadalupe, and uh, talk a little bit about that. Um, I'd like to go ahead and just start. Um, we can go ahead and uh, face the crucifix, look at the crucifix, and start with this prayer. This prayer is from uh, the, prayer, the prayer card, St. Thomas Aquinas, a prayer for students. Creator of all, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Creator of all things, true source of light and wisdom, origin of all being, graciously let a ray of your light penetrate the darkness of my understanding. Take from me the double darkness in which I have been born, and obscurity of sin and ignorance. Give me a keen understanding, a retentive memory, and the ability to grasp things correctly and fundamentally. Grant me the talent of being exact in my explanations and the ability to express myself with thoroughness and charm. Point out the beginning, direct the progress, and help in the completion. I ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I want to go ahead and just start with um, talking about... You know, we'll, we'll, finish, we'll finish this talk with the story of Our Lady Guadalupe. Uh, the apparition of Our Lady in 1531 in Mexico, which is extremely important uh, to America since Our Lady is the patroness of the Americas. But um, really, the section that I'll be taking in, in this whole packet, uh, you can find this packet online if you go to linktoliturgy.com. You can see this whole packet online. And I'll be uh, speaking today, this lesson is on the three battles. And then we'll talk about how Our Lady of Guadalupe um, connects into this battle. So first of all, I just want to focus on the fact that there's um, there's three battles that we can talk about. And th these are really battles um, throughout salvation history that ha have our salvation at stake. Uh, the first battle is called the Battle of Heaven. And this battle is probably pretty familiar to you. The Battle of Heaven <coughs> is when uh, Lucifer, and we know that Satan, before you know, we, we've known him as Satan, he was Lucifer. He was the angel of lights, uh, the angel of light. So, so Lucifer um, was in heaven. And this is really a battle between Lucifer versus God. And so what we know of this battle um, is that, obviously what we know is that Lucifer and then a third of the angels uh, fell from heaven that they, uh, they rebelled against God, they actually fought against God, and they were thrown out of heaven by St. Michael. This is why we, the, the St. Michael prayer is so powerful when we ask uh, St. Michael's protection and safeguard against the wickedness and snares of the devil. And, and this is because St. Michael was able to cast them out of um, heaven. <clears throat> and so with Lucifer, and then we have a third of the angels. So Lucifer, the angel of light, And a third of the angels fell from heaven. So the question is, why, why, why did they rebel? What was it? And um, Archbishop Fulton Sheen, uh, who, who taught uh, in America, a great teacher. He was on the television in the, in the 50s. Um, and, and, and part of the teaching of the church is that, you know, we're not quite sure exactly, but we do know that, that God would have revealed his plan to them. God makes his will known to every, every creature. Uh, whether it be an angel, whether it be a human, to every soul, God will reveal his plan. Um, it's our question, you know, will we rebel against this plan? Will we rebel against the plans of God? And so in this case, uh, what we have is, is we have God, you know, revealing his plan to the angels. We're not sure quite what that is, but it, it would have been something as if he would have revealed um, the fact that he would become human. And so when we look at that, and we look at God is up here, and then we look at the angels. This is kind of the hierarchy of creation. And then we have the humans. So God revealed that he would become man, that the word would become flesh. And, and not just that, but that actually he would be born of a woman, that, that he would be formed inside her womb. 
And, and part of that, especially as we're here in Advent getting ready, we see the humility of that. The fact that God would become vulnerable, that he would humble himself, that, that he would become a baby that, that could be killed by Herod, that, that he would cry, that he would um, you know, go through all the emotions that a human goes through, and that he would um, experience everything that humans experience outside of sin. But then we see at the cross that he actually even experiences the effects of sin, the effects of our sin. So even in that, even though Jesus Christ never sinned personally, he did um, definitely, uh, we know, um, ex experience or feel the effects of sin. Just like us, if we don't, we may not commit a sin, but someone else in our life may commit a sin that we um, feel the, the uh, I guess, the damages of that sin or the effects of that sin. So here, back in heaven, we have God that's revealing his plan to the angels. In the angel, Lucifer says no. He says, I do not agree with that plan. I will not submit to this plan. I will not allow my God, the God I worship, to humble himself and become a man. Now, <clears throat> it, it makes it a little bit easier to understand this when we go to the gospel. And we remember that a very dramatic encounter between Jesus and St. Peter, our first pope. And if we remember that, um, you know, this is when Jesus comes to his apostles and he says to them, who do people say that I am? And Peter steps up and says, you are Christ, the son of the living God. You know, he says what the other people say. And then he says, Jesus says, who do you say I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And, and, and of course, he gets their answer right. Jesus um, is, is pleased. But then Jesus kind of foretells, okay, well, this is what I'm going to do. Now that you know I'm the Christ, this is what the Christ must do. Jesus Christ must die. I must suffer and I must die. And it's at this moment when, when Jesus, who is God, reveals this to his apostles, it's at this moment that Peter says, no, no, surely this won't happen. He, he's, he's rebelling against this will of God. Jesus says, I must die. And Peter is saying, no, no. No, you can't. And, it, and it's at this moment that Jesus looks to Peter and says, Get behind me, Satan. And this goes back to that first battle of heaven where Lucifer tells God, No, no, I will not. Now the difference between, um, the difference between when the angels say no and when humans say no. When they said no, when Lucifer and the angels say no to God, when they say no to his will, they're doing it with full consent and full knowledge. Remember, angel has a soul as well as humans. We have souls. So that means we both have intellect and we both have free will. The difference is the angels are not fallen yet. So their intellect is not darkened and they don't have that concupiscence. So that, that tendency to sin, that tendency to misuse their free will. So the difference between the humans and the angels is that you know, this is, a, uh, this is a decision. When they say no, they're doing it with full consent and full knowledge. And, and they're actually, um, because they have just souls and not bodies, they're eternal. So this decision, this no, is eternal. It's a no that will be devastating to them because when they say no, it's a permanent decision. Okay, there's no turning back here. So what happens is Lucifer... And of a third of the angels, they rebel. They fight against God. And St. Michael, the archangel, casts them out of heaven. So where do they go? Well, St. Peter answers this in his letter. He says that uh, the devil is like a, a, a roaring lion prowling around the earth, seeking the ruin of souls. So what is their job now? Well, they're prowling around the earth. That's where they're at. They're prowling around the earth. And this is Satan and his demons. And they seek the ruin of souls. Okay, they know that they've lost. They know that they've lost. They've been cast out of heaven. Never again will they be in heaven. Never again will they have that intimacy with God and be face to face with him. They won't have it. They've been cast out. And so now their goal, they're, they're very, he's, Satan is a very sore loser, and he wants more than anything to bring our souls with him. He wants more than anything to, um, you know, it says misery loves company. He, he wants our souls 
to be away from God and to have that separation from God, which is truly what sin does. It separates us from God. And so when we're looking at this, um, we can see, you know, we, we can't take Satan lightly at all. Um, we have to see that, you know, if, if Lucifer, think about this. If Lucifer was able to convince a third of the angels, that's a lot of angels, a third of the angels, if he was able to convince and sway them onto his side, imagine how hard he's going to try to convince us and to sway us to be on his side. Imagine how hard he will try to have us give up our souls, to give up that intimacy with God, and to use our intellect and our free will to choose to turn away from God just as he did. So this is the first battle. And of course, if we, if we put a little tally up here, we can put a little scoreboard. Uh, let's put it right here. You know, this is the Satan scoreboard. You know, d does he win or does he lose? He loses this one. One loss, zero wins. Okay? So now we move into the second battle. Okay? We move from the first battle, the battle of heaven, into the next battle, which is, this is the battle of the garden. Okay, this is uh, Adam and Eve. You know, we, so we move into the garden. We have Adam and Eve. And, and another thing, I guess, to remember with this is, you know, when we have this battle over here, the battle of heaven, all we, we, you know, God doesn't reveal everything to Satan. Um, Satan and the angels don't have the privilege, of the, or, or they don't have the privilege of knowing the complete picture of God, just as we don't know the complete picture of God. But God does reveal to, reveal to them what they need to know and what he wishes them to know. And part of it is, is he reveals that he will become human. But he doesn't say how he'll become human. He doesn't necessarily say what human it will be that will be the God-man. He doesn't say, you know, um, it will be this person at this time. So Satan has to, has to really kind of say, well, who will it be? Who will um, be the Word made flesh? And we know that this is true because, you know, for instance, why does Satan take Jesus into the desert? He does it to tempt him, to try him, to test him, because he wants to see, is this the Son of God? Is this the one? Is this the one that I need to attack? And, and you notice after the baptism, it's revealed. You know, the heavens are open, the dove comes down, and, and, um, and there's a voice from heaven that says, this is my beloved Son. So... You know, there is an indication, of course, that this, this could be the Messiah. This could be the Son of God. And, of course, Satan wants to know who is the Word made flesh. Who is the person of Jesus Christ? Who is the Son of God? Because that's the person he wants to attack. And once he finds out what his target is, you know, more than anything, he wants to attack all humans, but he especially wants to attack the Son of God. He especially wants to attack God incarnate. And so once he finds out, okay, this is Jesus, then his plan he wants to kill God. He wants to destroy this life, of course. So, um, when we go to Adam and Eve, we have to imagine, okay, Satan has made war then with all of humanity. He wants every soul destroyed. And so, of course, the first humans, our human parents, are the first humans, he wants to destroy them. And so what he does, if you notice what he does, he creeps into the garden. He, he comes uninvited. Um, he, he slithers his way in, and he starts a conversation with Adam and Eve. And, and the, the thing that he wants to do is he wants to sow doubt. He wants to put doubt in their mind. And he says, you know, the first thing he says, he, he says, eat, eat, from this, eat from this fruit. And they say, no, if we, eat from this tr tr if we eat from this fruit, we will die. And then he immediately starts to just uh, basically put them at odds with God, and he says, did he really say that? Did God really say that? Surely you won't die if you eat that fruit. Right from the beginning, he's the father of lies. Satan is the father of lies. And he wants to sow this doubt in us. He comes into our life in the same way, just as he did our parents. He comes into our life, and he says, can you really trust God? Did he really say that to you? Do you really think you're forgiven? Do you really think you can serve God? Do you really think you could go to heaven? Do you really think there is a heaven? All of these things to get us to not trust. He's the father of lies, but he knows that God is our father. 
You know, just like we say in the, in, the, in the prayer, the Our Father, right? God is our Father, and what Satan would like to do more than anything is to put a mistrust, you know, so that we won't trust our Father, so that we can think that somehow God is going to trick us, or somehow God um, is not going to take care of us. So what he does in this battle is he comes in and he starts sowing these lies. Now, just for a second, let's think of our baptismal vows. When we take our baptismal vows, you know, the first question is asked is, do you reject Satan? And I think all of us would, of course, say yes. Of course I reject Satan. Um, you know, who, who would go ahead and accept Satan on purpose? Um, we want to reject Satan. But the next two questions are a little bit more, I think, what we should focus on. And that is, do you reject his empty promises? Because if Satan were just to kind of walk in the room and, and, and announce himself, of course you would reject that. But how many times are empty promises offered to us? And in what forms are they offered to us? We must reject those empty promises. And then the, the glamour of sin, the glamour of sin. You know, how, how many times in our life, even today, has the, the glamour of sin been presented to us? And so, yes, we have to reject Satan. We have to reject all that is satanic. This, but we also have to remember the empty promises are what's going to try to trip us up. That, that Satan will give us this promise, and in the end it's empty, and we fall for it. And that, that Satan will give this, this, this sin, and he's not going to present sin as a bad thing. He's going to present it as glamorous, as it's something that we need. And so that's exactly what he does to Adam and Eve. He, he, he presents this empty promise to them. He, uh, he presents the fruit as a very glamorous thing. And they rebel. They rebel against God. And so what happens with this, if we put the, the scoreboard, you know, we have it here. Once again, the Satan scoreboard, we have loss. He's already lost in the battle of heaven. Well, now he's won. So now this is a tie game. You know, when we're talking about these battles, this is now a tie game. And, and, and so what he's going to do, we can, we, can, we can be for sure that since he won here, he lost here, and he won here, that he's going to try the same thing with us. He's going to try to do the same thing with us that he did with Adam and Eve. He's, he's going to try to pit us against our father. Um, okay, and with this, I think it's important just to, to mention um, Genesis 3.15. And this is the verse that, um, where God says to Satan, where he says, I will put enmity. I will put enmity between you and the woman. And her offspring will crush your head. And so all of a sudden, once there's a tie game, we don't lose hope because immediately the gospel is, is presented. There's, there's, a, um, there's a, basically a, a prophecy of the gospel that there will be the child of the woman that will crush the head of Satan. So even though it's a tie game here, we know that there's already a hint of victory. And this leads us to our third battle. And, and the third battle is just extremely important because the third battle is really, it's, it's now. Okay, and, and during this time of Lent, it's interesting that Our Lady Guadalupe, that this feast day comes during the time of Lent because, um, you know, we're supposed to be on watch now. We're supposed to be ready now. And we have to be ready because the battle is now. So for this one, um, I'm just going to go ahead and read from Scripture on this third battle. And to understand this third battle, we have to go to Revelation 12. I'm just going to go ahead and read this uh, from the booklet. And this is Revelation 12. You can read Revelation 12, 1 through 17. And we'll just kind of walk through this. Now remember, this is uh, St. John uh, writing Revelation. And, and, it, and it's like, a, it doesn't completely make sense because it kind of jumps around. Very much like a, a dream or any type of revelation would kind of jump from place to place. So what we're going to see in this reading is we're going to see that it, it starts with kind of the picture, but then it's going to go from, it's going to kind of jump from a story here to then back to the battle of heaven that we just spoke of earlier. So let me just go ahead and read this. It says in Revelation 12, 1 through 17, A great sign appeared in the sky, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head, a crown of 12 stars. Okay, so before this chapter in Revelation, they were speaking of the Ark of the Covenant. And the Ark of the Covenant is, is, for the Jewish, for the Israelites, was what 
carried their most precious things. Um, it, it was the most precious thing, you know, God's presence on earth. Now, Mary has always been seen, and it's always been taught by the church, that Mary is the new Ark of the Covenant because she holds Jesus Christ. Um, so right after we have the Ark of the Covenant in Revelation, we have this uh, great sign up here in the sky, a woman. So this woman is Mary. So we read on. She was with child and welled aloud in pain as she labored to give birth. Then another sign appeared in the sky. It was a huge red dragon. So we have her child. So the woman is going to give birth. We know that the child of Mary is Jesus. And then we have this other sign, a red dragon. Not just a red dragon, but a huge red dragon. Seven horns, seven heads, ten horns, and on its heads were seven diadems. Okay? And this is Satan. So we already have the characters that there's Mary, this woman that's giving birth to a child. The child will be Jesus um, and the red dragon, Satan. And it says that its tail, this is Satan's tail, the red dragon, its tail swept away a third of the stars in the sky. And that reminds us back of the third of the angels that fell with Lucifer at the beginning. It says then that... Um, then the dragon stood before the woman to give birth. So I can imagine just this woman giving birth, you know, maybe like, you know, about to give birth in the hospital room, and then uh, this big dragon's there about to devour the child. And so then the dragon stood before the woman about to give birth to devour her child. So, you know, this is not playing around. He wants to devour the child. Remember, he's a sore loser. He wants to not just uh, hurt, but to devour, to totally destroy the child. If you remember over here, he has been cast out. He has lost everything. He has lost, and he is a sore loser. Um, I remember when I was a kid um, in fifth grade, I, I remember when I played football in fifth grade, that our team wasn't very good, and we would lose a lot. I'm kind of ashamed to say this, but, but when we were losing really, really bad, and we knew we couldn't win the game, let's say it was like 47-0 to zero or something, we would actually decide as a team to go hurt the other team. Um, we would be bad sports and we would try to take out the running back or take out the quarterback. And so there's a point where we said, we can't win this game, so let's just hurt the other side. And that's exactly what Satan is saying. I can't win this game, so I'm going to hurt them. And what he wants to do with us is he wants to hurt our soul. Not just hurt our soul, but he wants to devour. He wants to devour um, us, and that's what he's doing. He wants to devour this child. So, the dragon stood before the woman to devour her child when she gave birth. She gave birth to a son, a male child, destined to rule all the nations with an iron rod. Her child, so right when he's about to devour this child, this is what happened. It says, her child was caught up to God and to his throne. So right as Satan is trying to devour Jesus, he's caught up. To the throne. Okay, now this is a, um, a reference to the resurrection, but also to the ascension, right? That Jesus is, is taken up. Satan tries to get him, but he can't. Okay, so what do you do? What do you do if you're the big red dragon, huge red dragon, you're Satan, and you can't get the child? If you can't get the child, who do you go after? And if you think of movies like The Godfather and all these you know, other movies, you know, what is it that, that uh, if they can't get you, what do they try to go? They go after your family. Specifically, they would go after your mother because everyone loves their mother. And so what happens is he can't get Jesus, okay? Satan can't get Jesus. Jesus is caught up, right, to the throne, the resurrection and ascension. So now he's going to go after the woman. So it says the woman herself fled into the desert where she had a place prepared by God that there she may be taken care of for 1260 days. Okay, at this point then, the story kind of jumps back to the battle of heaven. It says, Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels battled against the dragon. The dragon and his angels fought back, but they did not prevail, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. The huge dragon, the ancient serpent, who is called the devil and Satan, who deceived the whole world, was thrown down to earth, and its angels were thrown down with it. 
So I want to go ahead and skip a little bit farther to from this story that just happened in Revelation back to this story. Satan is trying to get Jesus. He can't. And so he's now going to go after Mary. It says, when the dragon saw that it had been thrown down to earth, saw that he has been thrown down to earth, it pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. So now he's going after Mary. He can't get Jesus. He's now going to go after Mary. And it says, uh, he pursued the woman, but the woman was given two wings of the great eagle. Okay, so if you can imagine this huge red dragon that's chasing this woman, it's kind of like a video game. And, and the woman's running and running and running, and then all of a sudden, right when the, the dragon's going to maybe get this woman, um, the, the eagle, you know, um, says two wings of a great eagle. You can just imagine this, this eagle uh, sweeping up this woman and flying off with the woman, maybe like a Lord of the Rings type of thing, um, so that she could fly to her place in the desert, where far from the serpent, she was taken care of for a year, two years, and half a year. So all of a sudden, you know, the dragon can't get this woman. But he doesn't give up. Of course he doesn't give up. The serpent spews a torrent of water out of his mouth. So he spews all this water towards the woman to wash her away. And the earth opens up. It says, but the earth helped the woman by opening its mouth, opened its mouth, and swallowed the flood that the dragon spewed. So the, the dragon tries to get the woman, and the eagle rescues the woman. And then he, the dragon spews water at the woman, at Mary, and the earth opens up and the water goes in. So... Obviously, he can't get Mary. So, Jesus, he can't get. Mary, he can't get. And so this is what the last sentence says. Then the dragon became angry with the woman. Then the dragon became angry with the woman. Well, that's obvious. Of course, he's going to be angry. He can't get Jesus, the child. He can't get Mary, the mother, the woman. So it says this. He's angry. So now we have Satan. He can't do what he wants. His, his, his main target, his main objective doesn't happen. And so he's angry. And he does this. He goes off, went off to wage war. Okay, and who is he going to wage war against? He's going to wage war against Mary's offspring. It says her offspring. Satan is going to wage war against her offspring. So who is her offspring? Well, Mary is called the mother of the church. Uh, we know because of her perpetual virginity, she only had Jesus. This was her only child, right? Um, the, the one and only son of God. The rest of her offspring, therefore, is us. It's the faithful. It's those, uh, it's the, she is the mother of the church, so, so the faithful. And in, and in case we're confused about this, actually the very last sentence says that her offspring are those that keep God's commandments. That's one of the criteria. And then the second one is bear witness to Christ. So, it, we are the offspring of Mary if we do these two things. Okay? Those that keep the commandments of God and those that bear witness to Christ. You know, by our name alone, Christian, you know, to be a Christ bearer, to be a little Christ, to imitate Christ in all ways, especially that of holiness. That's what we're called. Be holy. And, and, and how do we do that? We keep the commandments. You know, it's, it's not enough. You know, we have to actually do the will of the Father. We have to keep the commandments, um, especially the commandments of love, right? to love God and to love neighbor. If we do this, which is what we do, which is what we're called to do, then Satan will wage war against us. And, and he couldn't get Jesus, he couldn't get Mary, and so now he goes after us. So what does this mean to us? Well, if, if we put the, the scoreboard back up here, you know, if, if we say the win, you know, does he win this battle? Well, he definitely doesn't win against Jesus and Mary. So ultimately, he's, he's lost. He won one battle, okay? But he's lost two. Now, how do, we know this, you know, how do we know he's lost? Well, when Jesus dies on the cross, he says, it is finished. And what this means is that Jesus 
has won the battle. It is finished. He has won. And, and when we speak of the church, we speak of Christ as the head and us as the members, the body. The head has won. The head has won the battle. Jesus Christ has won. Mary, our Lady of Sorrows, ha has also won because she is connected to Christ. She is there at the foot of the cross, embracing all of those sufferings, embracing all of that grace, and as a channel of that grace for us. So Jesus and Mary have won. It is finished. It is done. But we don't know if we've won yet, because we don't know if we have connected ourselves to that victory. Have we chosen that victory? We know who wins, and we know who loses. And we know that Satan has only won one, and our, our Lord has won two of these battles. And it is now done. It was a tie game here, but now the game is over. The game is over for Jesus and Mary. They have won. The game is over for all the saints. That's why we say the church triumphant. The church in heaven is the church triumphant. Okay, they're triumphant. What is their triumph? The cross, right? The victory is in the cross. So the game is over for them. The church triumphant, the game is over, but it is not over for us. We still have to choose that side, and we still have to unite. If we want to win, we have to stay connected to Mary and Jesus. Okay? And then one last thing, and this is, this is pretty interesting. If we see that um, in these battles, it kind of goes, you know, throughout of salvation history. But we have this one in Genesis. Uh, this is Genesis 3.15. And then we have this in Revelation. So we have the beginning of the book of the Bible, the first book of the Bible, the last book of the Bible. And if we look, it's foretold here, that we, like we said before, that, um, that I will put enmity. God says, I will put enmity between the woman and you. And he's talking to Satan. And her offspring will crush your head. Her, her son will crush your head, crush your head, and that's, and that's um, Jesus. Now, Jesus died. The, the hill that he died on is called Golgotha. Golgotha means place of the skull. And the reason it was called the place of the skull is because it actually looked like a skull. It kind of had little indentions in it. Uh, maybe little caves or little um, you know areas there, and and it did look like a, a like a skull. And so Golgotha, the place of the skull, this is where Jesus is crucified. So if you can imagine a cross on the top of Golgotha, this cross is driven into the skull, and and this cross is our is our trophy. It's our trophy of victory. You know, when we have this word victory, this is where we get the word victor. You know, those that are named Victor or Victoria, their, their name bears witness. It bears witness to the victory of Christ. And so this cross is our trophy because it's by his death on the cross and then his resurrection, his passion, death, and resurrection, that he has crushed the head, that he has crushed the head of Satan. The victory is done. The victory has been won. Jesus can say, it is finished. Is it finished for us, though? It's finished for him if we choose to unite ourselves to him. We have to stay united to Jesus Christ, who is the victor. We have to stay united to Our Lady, who, who is in victory. We have to stay united to the communion of saints, those in heaven, that the church triumphant. This is why it's so important at Mass that we sing with all the choirs of angels and saints. And if we sing with them now and we join in that, that uh, beautiful song now, the Sanctus, 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 right? If we sing with that now, holy, holy, holy now, we want to sing that forever with them. That is our victory anthem. That is our, our chant of victory that we can say, the cross is my trophy and the Sanctus is my anthem. And we want forever to unite ourselves to this victory. God bless you. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.